I was a small child in the heyday of the sung theme tune. Born free. And that, plus my fascination with how words are pronounced, has given me a lifelong obsession with word rhythms that are hidden in music, specifically theme tunes. In this video, we're going to look at how and why this happens, and hopefully you'll find some surprises along the way. So let's get into that right now. We can hear the rhythm of words in music because there are definite conventions for how words and music are put together. And the main factor is stress. Basically, stressed syllables in words are set to stressed notes in the music. Musical stresses, or beats, tend to be very regular and are usually based on a repeating count, like 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And the main stress is generally on the ones. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. The stresses in English words are shown in dictionaries, at least for words of more than one syllable. Now, with one syllable words, we generally stress content words and don't stress most kinds of function words. Here's the first part of the Star Spangled Banner. The musical rhythm is a count of three, and here are the syllables that fall on the ones. Every count of one, or the first beat of the bar as it's called, is on a content word. And where the content word has two syllables, proudly, twilight, gleaming, that count of one is on the stressed syllable. Now, most popular songs have a count not of three, but of four. And in this pattern, both the one and the three are stronger beats and can carry the pulse. One, two, three, four, etc. Here, I'll show stressed syllables on beat one in red and stressed syllables on beat three in blue. Now, this is obviously a very quick overview of stress in words and musical rhythm. So if you want to go more into both those areas, I can recommend some very nice accessible classes on Skillshare. And in fact, Skillshare has kindly agreed to sponsor this video. It's an online learning community with literally thousands of classes by professionals and enthusiasts. There are lots of classes on musical fundamentals from complete beginner level to this mind-expanding class by the amazing Jacob Collier. You could say divide that into fives, which is really fun, which is like... <laughs> Accent coach Sheila Lebedenko has this very thorough class on the rhythm of English, focusing on general American, but also great for British and other accents. You can explore the whole library of classes for free because the first 1,000 people to use the link in the description get a month's free trial. So thank you to Skillshare for providing this offer and for sponsoring the video. So a given group of musical notes will be appropriate for some words, but not for others. We can show this nicely by comparison with a Japanese title song. The title character's name is lined up with the music in two ways. The first time, it's the initial syllable that's put on beat number one, totoro. The second time, it's the middle syllable that's associated with beat number one, totoro. Actually, in the song, that syllable starts slightly ahead of its beat, which is called syncopation. For simplicity's sake, I won't say any more about syncopation in this video, but I'll show these syncopated syllables in italics. So the song goes, totoro, totoro. Now, this is possible because the Japanese language doesn't have stress, but English won't let you do this. The first three-note pattern would fit the name Hercules, and the second three-note pattern would fit the name Aladdin. Hercules, Aladdin. But swap those names around and the result is a train wreck. Aladdin, Hercules. Impossible. As the old joke goes, it's putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Now, even when a piece of music isn't sung, sometimes the melody has been written to fit the title. And over the years, this has been done a lot with TV and film themes. 
Take the old sitcom Bewitched. The tune has a two-note motif with the second note linked to beat one. How do we know this isn't just a coincidence? Well, in this case, there was a sung version, though it wasn't used in the actual TV show. Bewitched. Bewitched. Back in the 1960s, it was quite common for producers of a film to want a song released with the same title. What's it all about, Alfie? Bavarella Psychedella. And of course, the most famous 60s example of all is amazingly still with us, more or less. Gold finger, diamonds are for your eyes only. License to keep golden eyes, disguise hold. There's just no time to die. So composers would often anticipate the demand for a song by making sure the tune would fit. Now, the actual song that was released to coincide with that hit film actually had the more romantic words Around the world I've searched for you But surely the composer was originally thinking of Around the World in 80 Days. Sometimes there was an associated song, but hardly anyone knew about it. Yes, there actually was a song with that tune, but this time the lyrics were different from the title. Cheesy, fresh as a daisy. But I don't think it's accidental that the title would have been just as good a fit. The composer of the famous Star Trek theme tune, Alexander Courage, didn't have a song in mind, but he still began his theme with two strong notes to match the compound noun Star Trek. Now, according to Wikipedia, behind the composer's back, Star Trek producer Gene Roddenberry wrote amateurish lyrics to the theme, not in the expectation that they would ever be sung, or indeed ever be made publicly available, but so that he could be officially registered as the lyricist of the theme, and hence claim half the performance royalties, not quite up to the ethical standards of Captain Kirk. But dreadful though those lyrics are, Roddenberry inevitably put the words Star Trek on that two-note rising motif. Sometimes there may be associated words that aren't sung, but spoken or even shouted. Trekonori. But even when there are no explicitly associated words at all, composers still sometimes base a tune's rhythm on the title. Why would they do this? Someone's going to come to you and they're going to say, I have this film and I have this video game and make a soundtrack for me. And in the beginning, it might feel like an overwhelming burden. The actors, art department, costume designers, etc. all have their instructions in the script, but the composer has a blank slate in front of them, and often less time than anyone else gets to produce the music. How can they get started? Well, there's always that title page. Two things kind of inspired me, if you like. The first being the title, Black Beauty, and that, I thought, well, that should kind of indicate where the title comes right at the beginning of the tune. So I came up with this thing, went, da da da, I thought, Black Beauty. Sometimes it, there'll be something in the title that you go, ooh, in my little tune that had da da da, came from the title, Dynasty. There again, he used the words Danger Man to write the tune, which was da 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 ba, which was Danger Man. Often nobody notices that a composer has used the title's rhythm as inspiration, or almost nobody. Sometimes it gets spotted by comedy writers. The theme to Hill Street Blues. But that doesn't have any lyrics. The hell it doesn't. Hill Street Blues. Hill Street Blues 
Hill Street Blues, I got those Hill Street Blues. A Star Wars, <laughs> nothing but Star Wars. Give me those Star Wars, don't let them in. In both those cases, the joke is partly because actually singing the words of the title, at least since the 1970s, has been perceived as naive, childish, cheesy or comical. But the joke also seems to be based on the idea of a funny coincidence. Guess what? You can fit the words Star Wars and Hill Street Blues to their theme tunes. But my view is, of course you can. The opening two notes of Star Wars fit those two words, just like they fit the words King's Row in the old score that it was inspired by. <laughs> This was hardly the only time John Williams did this. And I think the wonderful a cappella group Maytree know exactly what composer Jerry Goldsmith was thinking of here. Like John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith did this quite often. Here's a Jerry Goldsmith theme that's a good example of the title rhythm appearing at the end of the tune rather than the beginning. And sometimes the rhythm is at the end and the beginning and all the way through. Of course, if the composers don't actually tell us, it's hard to prove that these things were conscious and intentional. Doctor Who seems obvious to me, but some versions of the tune make it less clear, and some people I've pointed it out to aren't as convinced as I am. But often the editors or animators of a title sequence go to a lot of trouble to show us the title in time with the music. Starting with Jerry Goldsmith again. <laughs> Hidden words aren't restricted to English. The international TV hit from Spain, Gran Hotel, has a title sequence that uses light bulbs to point out the three note theme. Of course, two and three note motifs are common in music, but when a tune matches a long title, it seems way beyond a coincidence, because long titles aren't so easy to set to music. 007 composer John Barry didn't attempt a song or even a word rhythm when the title had nine syllables. <laughs> But the composer Sir Richard Rodney Bennett did manage to hide a nine-syllable title in one of his best-known film themes. I couldn't believe I'd missed it when it suddenly hit me decades after I first saw the film. I 
thought that must have been the all-time winner. But then it was pointed out to me that the remarkable TV composer Ronnie Hazelhurst had gone one syllable further. Ronnie Hazelhurst wrote many of the best-known and most-loved British theme tunes of the 70s and 80s, and was famous to some at least for integrating the titles into his themes. Surely the apotheosis of Hazelhurst's word-hiding was for the 1970s series The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin. Yes, that's ten syllables. And he also manages to have the musical line fall on the word fall and rise on the word rise. <laughs> I'll end back with probably the most celebrated film composer of all, John Williams, and some suggestions for words that might be hidden in a few of his best-known tunes. The first two are probably just sheer coincidences, but if we take the two Steven Spielberg films that Williams scored in 1993, just listen to how the tunes end. Personally, I think these last two are more plausible. Raiders of the Lost Ark isn't as awkward a title as On Her Majesty's Secret Service, but it's more cumbersome than Star Wars, Superman and E.T. However, it is an Indiana Jones film. Finally, Harry Potter. The theme everyone associates with the film series, and which plays over the title of each one, was for some reason given the name Hedwig's theme. But I think that when John Williams was coming up with tunes for the first film, inspiration may have come, as so often before, from the title page. Let me know what you think, and please tell us your favourite examples of hidden words that I didn't include here. In the meantime, season's greetings and a happy new year. Do you know how Christmas trees are grown? They need sunshine. Sunshine can't grow Christmas trees alone. They need rain Raindrops can grow Christmas trees, here's a reason why.